Yeah. Hi guys, welcome to today's MCQ discussion, MCQ discussion number nine. Let's get started. So first question, which of the following cells is involved in the initiation and control of osteoclastic activity? A, osteocytes, B, osteoblasts, C, mononuclear cells, or D, phagocytes? Pause, think, and then we'll discuss. So yeah, the answer here is B, osteoblasts. So although this seems like a very fact-based question and you know, a very straightforward question. It has a deep concept hidden in it, which we'll discuss. And that concept is asked throughout exams and it's repeated again and again. And understanding that concept is vital. And this can be asked in an application-based way in, in many ways. So we need to understand this concept well. So remember, going back, there is a bone-forming cell and a bone-destroying cell. The bone-forming cells are the osteoblasts. And the bone destroying cells or the cells that bring about bone resorption are the osteoclasts. So although they have opposite, polar opposite functions, one forming and one destroying, it's important to remember that the bone forming cells, which are the osteoblasts, regulate and control the action of the osteoclasts completely. So the osteoclasts are completely under the control of the osteoblasts and only the osteoblasts can stimulate and activate the osteoclast. So remember, osteoclastic activity, that is the destroying activity, is completely under the control of the osteoblasts. So the answer is B. Now let's understand this concept at the cellular level because it is very, very important and you'll know in future discussions how this can be applied. So firstly, we need to know about the calcium hormone regulation briefly. We'll have an, another discussion about it in detail. But in brief, there are three hormones which regulate calcium. One is the parathyroid hormone, two, the vitamin D, and three is calcitonin. So remember, out of these three hormones, only one is hypocalcemic and that is calcitonin. The other two are hypercalcemic, which means they increase the blood calcium levels. So now we'll talk about parathyroid hormone because only that hormone is involved with this discussion. So parathyroid hormones are the hormones which increase the blood calcium levels by causing bone resorption. So at the level of the bone, they cause bone resorption and then increase the blood calcium levels. So we automatically assume that this parathyroid hormone, since it causes bone resorption, directly acts on the osteoclast and then the osteoclast destroy the bone and release calcium. But that thinking is wrong. And this is a common thinking we all have. That thinking is wrong. Remember, parathyroid hormone receptors are only found on the osteoblasts and therefore the parathyroid hormones can only act on the osteoblasts directly. They act on the osteoclasts indirectly. So let's understand this process. So parathyroid hormone is high and then this parathyroid hormone binds to the osteoblast receptors or the PTH receptors on the osteoblast and stimulate these osteoblasts to produce two things. One is called the rank ligand. It rather, it expresses this rank ligand. And the second thing is the MCSF, which is a macrophage colony stimulating factor. So PTH acts on the osteoblasts and these osteoblasts then produce the rank L and MCSF. And it is this rank L and MCSF that stimulates the conversion of precursor or stem cell osteoclasts into mature osteoclasts that can bring about bone resorption. So remember, once more we'll go through it, parathyroid hormone acts on the osteoblasts and these osteoblasts produce rank L and MCSF which then convert the osteoclast precursor cells or the stem cells into mature osteoclasts and these mature osteoclasts then cause bone resorption which in turn increases the blood calcium. So in one word, if you have to remember, remember or in one sentence, if you have to remember, PTH receptors are present only on osteoblasts and PTH can never directly act on osteoclasts or osteoclast precursors. So parathyroid hormone acts only via osteoblast and it is osteoblasts that can completely control the activity of the osteoclasts. So very important concept. We'll see how it's applied in future discussions. Without wasting more time, let's move to second. the second Question for the day, a 45 year old HIV positive or retropositive male presented with reddish purple papules on the right foot. Biopsy and Wharton starry stain revealed the causative organism. Which of the following is it? 
A. Bartonella B. Human herpes virus 8 C. HPV 16 Human papilloma virus 16 and D. Hum herpes simplex virus 1 so which could it be pause think and then we'll discuss okay so I hope you all have got this answer right so in most cases when we see a HIV positive patient with these reddish purple or dark violet papules the first thing that comes in our mind is Kaposi sarcoma right always that's a that's the first thing that comes in our mind and rightly so remember Kaposi sarcoma is a malignancy seen in immunocompromised patient caused by human herpes virus 8 okay that presents with similar reddish or purplish papules because it's a malignancy of the vessels and the lymph so it, this sounds in the first line it sounds like a classical Kaposi sarcoma and even the examiners know that's how we think and that's why they've added the second line which says biopsy and war thin starry staining reveal the causative organism so when this comes the answer does change so actually the answer for this question is a Bartonella Hensley and the condition in question is something called bacillary angiomatosis bacillary that is bacteria so bacillary and angiomatosis the, it, it presents just like Kaposi sarcoma you will have all these reddish purplish papules and the only difference in the question stem is biopsy and the warthin starry stain and remember the only real way you can differentiate between a KS Kaposi sarcoma and a bacillary angiomatosis is by biopsy so a few things here about so bacillary angiomatosis is an infectious vascular proliferative lesion which presents as reddish purple nodules similar to Kaposi sarcoma and can only be differentiated by biopsy so remember even examiners know you'll always think of Kaposi sarcoma and immediately mark HHV8 so please when you see a question regarding this or a question stem like this look if they mentioned biopsy look if they have mentioned starry warth and starry stain okay because it is a differential so bacillary angiomatosis is a differential for Kaposi sarcoma and always when you see this kind of a stem look if they are told about biopsy because it's a easy uh, you know it's a trick question or a place where we can make mistakes easily now let's look at the pictures so the first picture here is of bacillary angiomatosis and the second picture is of Kaposi sarcoma they look nearly the same and like I said clinically it's not possible to really differentiate which is which so biopsy is the only way you can differentiate and in case of BA you use warthin starry stain so look they look nearly the same remember these pictures though and now we'll talk about the warthin starry stain so that's what is seen here and you can see all these small black black dots they are bacilli remember Bartonella is a gram negative bacilli it's actually a very famous for causing cat scratch disease you might have read that before so cat scratch disease is what this same organism also causes but here we are talking about bacillary angiomatosis remember you will find all these which stain blackish or dark brownish in this stain and you can see a lot of clumps of them that are tangled together and that's a classical appearance so definitely none of these viruses can also see no microscope can be seen on microscopy so even if you got this question uh, and you didn't know what Bartonella was you can see a lot of organisms in this microscopy and, and the rest of the options were viruses so they were anyway all ruled out but for future remember Kaposi sarcoma and bacillary angiomatosis present in a very similar manner and you should make sure you're choosing the right one while solving next question question number three in which of the following situations is oxygen therapy most beneficial provided that the lung function is normal so think and then we'll discuss so this question or these kinds of questions it's best to approach them by going on a negative approach and ruling out options so the question here is where is oxygen therapy beneficial so option a and this is a previous year question okay so option a is anemia so now what happens in anemia in anemia we have reduced rbcs or reduced hemoglobin right which essentially means and again the definition of anemia is that the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is less so either the rbcs are less or the hemoglobin is so whatever it is the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is less so irrespective of how much oxygen we give even if we give 100% oxygen 
the patient won't improve significantly because the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is reduced it's like if you have 100 logs and one truck and that truck can only carry 20 logs even if you bring 200 300 logs it's not going to make a difference because only 20 or 50 logs can fit in that truck so the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is only that much so irrespective of how much oxygen we give it's not going to help so anemia is ruled out copd okay so in copd we have to remember one very important thing copd is nothing but chronic obstructive pulmonary disease okay and in copd especially in a chronic copd there is so much of carbon dioxide retention so remember in copd it's obstructive so the expiration is affected so co2 starts retaining in the body of the patient okay so over the years the amount of co2 being expired is less and another point to remember is that in normal individuals like us the respiratory drive is by hypercapnia so when co2 in the body is high it drives us to respire okay but in case of a copd because of years of co2 retention and a generally high co2 this function is lost and their respiratory drive comes from the fat from oxygen deprivation so remember in normal individuals the drive for respiration is hypercapnia or co2 high co2 whereas in copd the drive for respiration is low o2 or hypoxia so they are always in a mild state of hypoxia all copd patients are in a mild state of hypoxia and you should never administer oxygen to them unnecessarily even if the saturation is slightly low you shouldn't administer oxygen because it is this hypoxia that drives their respiration because co2 is no longer reliable they are already over years they have been accumulating co2 in their body because they can't expire so the the whole physiology of the body changes and it becomes a hypoxia driven respiration so if you remove the hypoxia by giving them high amount of oxygen then the respiratory dive, uh, drive reduces and when this respiratory drive reduces they'll have apnea they'll stop respiring so you don't give oxygen in copd so it doesn't benefit them so that's ruled out okay again option c is cyanide poisoning so if you remember what happens in cyanide poisoning uh, there is disruption of the electron transport chain so this cyanide binds with the cytochrome oxidase enzyme of the electron transport chain and when the etc is disrupted so because it binds to cytochrome oxidase the etc is disrupted and when the etc is disrupted the cells lose their ability to utilize oxygen so cells lose their ability to utilize oxygen leading to something called cellular hypoxia so even if you give lots of oxygen the cells cannot utilize it because the etc is defunct so remember there is cellular hypoxia so oxygen administration again doesn't help so the answer must be d high altitudes and definitely yes the answer is high altitudes and oxygen does help in high altitudes if you've seen mountain climbers mountaineers a lot of them especially when they go to everest and the highest peaks they always have an oxygen mask and an oxygen cylinder and that is because oxygen helps at such high altitudes why as we discussed in yesterday's discussion the lower the altitude the higher the pressure and the higher the pressure the more the solubility of a gas so on at sea level the pressure is normal atmospheric pressure and there is good oxygen solubility but as we keep going higher the pressure becomes lower and the solubility of all gases including oxygen decreases so supplemental oxygen helps at high altitudes anything you can you answer if even if you didn't know any of this you could answer with this question with just common sense remembering that mountaineers use oxygen carry oxygen mask and a cylinder cylinder with them all the time so the answer is d high altitude again from my point of view this question was really important because you should it helps you understand the concept of copd so remember in a normal healthy adult the expected saturation is 95 plus so in all of us it should be 97 to 98 usually but anything 95 plus is okay whereas for a copd the normal value is 88 to 92 like i told you the respiratory drive is because of this fact only if they are in hypoxia will their body respire for us it's hypercapnia for them it's hypoxia the physiology is changed in case of a copd patient so if a question comes patient who's a known case of copd comes with saturation of 89 percent with the rest of history what is the first step you would do option a give supplemental oxygen if that is there never choose give supplemental oxygen only if they are severely hypoxic 
that is if their saturation is less than 85 will you give supplemental oxygen even to them but if they are 88 to 92 88 89 you will not even 87 86 you will not give supplemental oxygen to these patients so please remember that copd the respiratory drive is through hypoxia having low oxygen whereas in normal adults the respiratory drive is through hypercapnia so co2 controls our respiration o2 controls their respiration so please 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 remember this point very helpful very important last question which among the following investigations is the best to diagnose typhoid in the first week think answer just a fact based question okay so the answer here in the first week the answer is b blood culture i've just added this question so i could give you this mnemonic which can help you remember this forever and this is again a frequently questioned topic typhoid is very important so remember the mnemonic is basu b a s u so in the first week b for blood so blood culture in the first week is the best investigation to send to identify the disease in the second week agglutination test which is nothing but vidal test is the best third week stool culture is positive you can send vidal also so third week is stool culture or vidal both have equal efficacy and in the fourth week even a urine culture can be found to be positive so remember basu first week blood culture is the best and only investigation that will work vidal is negative in the first week second week vidal shows low titers so it can be used third week both stool culture and vidal can help you uh, diagnose the condition and last week that is the fourth week even urine culture can be of some use again vidal also can be done and the gold standard remember the gold standard for salmonella is although these are the most done and the investigations of choice the gold standard is still bone marrow aspirate culture okay so the gold standard is bone marrow aspirate culture so that's it for today's discussion thank you hope it was useful see you tomorrow